beginning of the creation of God, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou were cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. And knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed. And that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve, and thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him. And he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and sit down with my father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Our final church tonight, amen, the church at Laodicean. Or Laodicea, the Laodicean church. And, you know, every time I uh, study one of these churches, I think, boy, that's, that's us today. No, wait, that's us today. No, wait, that's us today. And, and, and getting into Laodicea, amen. We Really, there's a portion of all these churches that if we're not careful, can affect us. And so, we want to talk tonight about the church of Laodicea. Lord Jesus, I thank you for your word. I thank you for understanding. I pray, God, that you would anoint these lips of clay, anoint our ears to hear, bring understanding to our mind, that we might grow closer to you. And can the church say amen? God bless you. You can be seated. I pray that you have been in, enjoying studying these churches and, and, and studying the prophecy and the revelations. And, and we're going to step up next week and we'll get into more things about uh about the rest of the book of revelation but the churches are, are very vital because it explains who and what we are it explains what weaknesses we can uh be open to it also explains the strengths of what we can achieve if we allow the lord amen to work in us amen now Laodicea was situated about 40 miles southeast of Philadelphia. So it wasn't very far away from that revival church that we heard about last week, that there's an open door on the road to Colossa. It was founded by Antiochus II in the middle of the 3rd century before Jesus, and it was named after his wife. Under Roman rule, Laodicea had become wealthy and had a profitable business arising from the production of wool cloth. So they were uh, very big into the wool trade. In fact, when the city was destroyed by an earthquake around 60 A.D., it was able to rebuild without any outside help. Its economic sufficiency, and that's something that really stood out to to me with the United States of America and, and we as a people. We are a very economical, economical, sufficient people. Really, we, uh, we're blessed. Even the poorest among us are blessed. I, I have said this often, and, and I truly believe this. If an individual truly wants help there is help available in this country and, and i know people were like oh now brother bumgarner uh i know lots of people they really want help no no they want uh, you to feel sorry for them 
They want to use you. I'm just being truthful today. Um, but if they really want help, they will be willing to discipline themselves, submit themselves. You know, that's the key word for any kind of success in life is submitting yourself to whatever the task may be, whether it's living for God, working a job, working in a marriage, Hello. And so, you know, we're, we're real good about uh, the men are especially, you know, because we love that scripture. The Bible says about wives submit to your husbands. But the word of God says submit ye one to another as well. <laughs> and so I understand headship. I, and I, I believe in that. I understand the context of that scripture. And, and I believe in headship in the house. I just I do. Uh, but I also believe we've got to be submitted to that marriage. We as men. And that's another lesson for another time. Amen. But, but some, being submitted to whatever is, is one of the toughest things uh, that you'll do. Being duty bound. You know, it's, 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 uh, it's one of those things where uh, you have to get up and go when even you don't feel like getting up and going. Amen. Why? Because I'm, I'm submitted to this. I am focused on this. I'm dedicated to this. Laodicea had a very strong economy. And, you know, and, and there's economies go up and down. There's cycles. Amen? Now, you know, I, I saw a video, uh, a clip. People are always posting crazy things. And, uh, and I'm not picking on oil field workers. I know that's affected some of our folks, and God's taking care of them. But uh, uh, it had a video, an oil field worker in, was it 2012 or 13, you know? And this guy, he's got a, a bunch of, I mean, he's got money. I mean, just a big old handful of money, because the oil field was booming. And, and uh, you know, it, he had so much money, since what he was just throwing it in the air, because, you know, like, like he didn't even care, you know? And then it, and then it showed a, uh, it said, oil field worker 2015, and the same guy that was throwing the money, he's reaching for the money in the air trying to grab a dollar. Because he was throwing it up in the air. And so what are we saying? Hey, there's good times in, in, in businesses, and then there's slow times. You know? And there's, there's been days when I've had uh, a plenty, and there's days when I've had very little. But uh, as Paul said, you find yourself to be content. And when we compare... Uh, our blessings, our finances, you know, we complain sometimes. Now, I know you're going to think I'm crazy. Now, one of my favorite meals, Brother Webb, especially when I was a single young man, back, 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 was to take ramen noodles, canned tuna, some cheese, and some chili powder. Throw in a little bit of Miracle Whip for good measure. And whip that up. And I'm telling you, you got something that tastes good. I know none of y'all, y'all like. Y y but you know what? Some of y'all shaking your head no. But there are some kids over in different places in the world. That if I was to cook that up for them. They couldn't get enough of it. They, they, I mean, they would, they, they'd think I was a master chef if I presented that to them. Because they don't even have that. We, we don't know what it is to have to fight over a bowl of rice. None of us go and think, you know, we don't go to Niners and say, oh, give me a bowl of rice. Just a simple bowl of rice, you know. Doesn't even have to be uh, served, or just, just, just a bowl of rice. No, we don't. Because we, we, our, our, our standards say that I want, I want the catfish and the shrimp and I want the, uh, you know, the rice and, uh, you know, I want the certain little things. And the reason I'm going on and on about this is that when you aren't concerned about the most basic necessity, which is food. I mean, we're blessed. 
We, we get up in the morning, and our biggest problem is trying to figure out what do I want to eat. Now, I've heard others like Brother Backus and others talk about, you know, that when they was kids, it was milk and rice and a little sugar. And, and that was a good breakfast. Amen. My, my mother, she used to bless us. Amen. I love chocolate, chocolate anything. And we used to have chocolate gravy for breakfast over biscuits. I mean, that's just like revival food. I can't do that anymore. But you know what? It's, do we want our eggs over easy? Do we want them scrambled? Do we want an omelet? You know, what do we want in our omelet? And we go to our pantries, and, and there we're, we're blessed. We, we've got food and, and staples that will keep us. Amen. We have gardens. We have gardens for not so much for food, but because we want to have a garden. We want the fresh produce. Amen. I don't know. There may be a day we might have to have a garden, amen, to keep us. You know, I, I never really understood. I didn't come through the Depression. But my grandmother did. And for years, until she was up close to 80 years old, every year she had a garden, a big garden. And she worked it. Amen. Every year. She wanted that garden. She had corn and green beans and squash and zucchini and cabbages. And, I mean, she, she had this whole area. It was just a big garden. You couldn't play in the garden. If you got caught in the garden, you got a spanking. <laughs> now, you know, we enjoyed the, the produce. We did as a family, you know. I mean, I had to go over and shell peas and pick corn and, and just help, help Grandma out. But, but I know her motivation was is, I remember a time when we didn't have she had an old root cellar anybody know what a root cellar is well in Oklahoma you have root cellar cellars you have them for two reasons they're cool damp places they put them in the ground and they pretty much uh, uh, you know put a concrete cellar in the ground and and have an old door on it and a once for tornadoes <laughs> but you go down to grandma's root cellar there were shelves there because she canned everything. Now, I know y'all probably don't know nothing about canning. Uh, you know something about canning, Sister Waddy? Because you didn't go to H-E-B or Walmart and get green beans for 50 cents a can or 43 cents a can, you know, and that's been processed and preserved and packaged. You know, you canned with Grandma. I mean, I, I can hear that whistle. Hey, Amen. They put all the jars in there and, the, and, and, and just, you know, when it was ready, that old thing get to rattling. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Man, they'd get to putting the, putting the lids on there, and then they put them down that root cellar. And man, they kept them cool and kept them preserved. And when it was time to feed the family, you go down to the root cellar. And you, but, you know, she was going back to a time when we didn't have, so we're going to put up. We're going to put up. We're going to put up. We're going we're gonna to save ourselves for tomorrow. We don't know what tomorrow holds. And let us be honest, because I'm talking about this. How many of you worried about tomorrow? You worried about tomorrow? Don't worry about it. It's all taken care of. <laughs> but no, we really don't worry about tomorrow. Now, I understand the Word of God tells us not to worry about tomorrow. Because sufficient to the day is the evil thereof. We, we don't know what tomorrow holds. We just, we're living for today. We're living right now. Now, the Lord, some, tomorrow something else could happen. But we... Um, we get lulled into a mindset that everything just takes care of itself. Because we're blessed, when we get sick, we may say a little prayer, but we're going to the medicine cap excuse me, medicine cabinet first. Huh? We we're, we're quick to run to a doctor before we run to the doctor. You know, and if we get into a, a little financial difficulty, it's quick to run to a bank or to a credit card versus getting on our knees and saying, Lord, I need some help. Well, that's the truth. And the Lord says, okay, as long as you want to figure it out and as long as you want to deal with the stress, I'm going to let you. 
But now if you want me to take over, you start giving it to me and start praying and start asking me to take care of it, I'll start taking care of it. But as long as you want to take care of it, God will let you. Now that's a, that's a message all to itself. But we're, we're a very uh, blessed people. I would say that most of us, our automobiles are not uh, over five years old. Now, some of us may have a little older, but, you know, automobiles are, are, are now, if you take good care of them, you know, they'll last you. My, my old Ford pickup, it's a 2005, and I love it. it. It's still just as nice as the day it came off the assembly line. And Sister Bumgarner, she loves Hondas, and hers is a 2004, and it still drives like the day it come off the assembly line. We're, I, what I'm saying is, is that, we're blessed. And we, we get caught up because the world is constantly pushing. Pushing, 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 pushing. You got to have new. You got to have new. You got to have new. Amen. And really, you don't. I'm just, I'm just going. Amen. I, I'm telling you. Now, I, I hope she don't mind, but like Sister Dean and Brother David, they, they bought that silver pickup of mine when I decided I needed a more passenger vehicle. And I know when I sold it to them, it had right at 200,000 miles on it. I don't even know how many miles it's got on it now because I see it running all over the place. <laughs> but, uh, you know, back in the day, if a car had 100,000 miles on it, boy, you better turn that in. It's a wore-out vehicle. But in our day and age, if you take care of things, they last. Now, that's just to say, you know what? We have good roofs over our head. And you say, well, how is that reflective? Because when I look at Laodicea, the thing that, that really struck, struck me was this. They had money. They had enough commerce to rebuild what they needed to rebuild. And, and let's just be honest. We, we, we don't suffer in, in uh, comparison to other places in the world. We don't suffer. Amen. We, we have comfortable beds to sleep in. We have decent clothes. Amen. You can go to Goodwill and buy clothes on pennies on the dollar. I went to a Goodwill store, store in Pearland, Texas. And uh, bought a Kenneth Cole suit for seven dollars. Cha chain. <laughs> I couldn't have bought that suit anywhere else. You know, guys come up and open you. Oh, you got a Kenneth Cole? That's right, I got a Kenneth. Cole. I'm a blessed man. It's like the Lord gave me a present. I needed a suit, and I didn't have no money. But uh. Uh, you know, I, I frequent those kind of places. I believe in looking for a good deal. And you know what? Here in the United States, we're so blessed that Goodwill stores, resale shops, they're a big business. And, and, and it doesn't hurt our other businesses. And I guess what I'm saying is we have such an abundance of stuff that our resale shop can sell Stuff that's been used, but I mean, it's barely used. It looks brand new. Amen. I can take you to Pasadena, Texas, and I can take you to, to every one of them. I used to go to them and, and go shopping because you can find good deals there. Would you rather pay $1.50 for a shirt or $15 for a shirt? Well, it's for me. I pay $1.50. Say, Brother Bumgarner, you started to make yourself look bad. No, but I'm talking about how blessed our country is. That even those that, that live beyond what we call poverty, there's outlets for them to go uh, and, and be able to, to exist. Amen. Mr. Frank is always, he, he's a big penny pincher, and, and he's always on Sister Bumgarner about the store right up there in Rosenberg. Um, Aldo's or Adlo's or Aldi's. Aldi's. He said, that's where you got to go. You can find great deals. He said, you can get green beans for 30 cents a can. You got to go right now. Go buy five cases. <laughs> and even in, the, in, that, in, the, in, in that world, we're, we're, we're blessed abundantly. You know, and, and so um, 
if somebody in our day and age living here says they're hungry, there's a problem. I've had folks start coming to church and, and they'll be like, hey, I, I need $20 for some food. And I'll say, I'll tell you what, I'll just go buy you $20 worth of food. H-E-B's right there. And a lot of folks tell me, well, you know, we don't like you put you out. Oh, it's not putting me out. <laughs> I'll go with you right now. We'll get you $20 worth of groceries. It's amazing how many of them don't stick around. And I'm not mean to folks now. I'm not mean to folks, but that's, I've offered them food. And so um, the church at Laodicea was, was a very blessed church. And if we're not careful, we can get lulled to sleep spiritually. Because here's what happens. When I am self-sufficient, I don't have to lean on him. Sometimes when you go through things, God is trying to let you know, I want you to depend upon me. I want you to trust me. I want you to look to me. And if the only thing I can do is take away some of your financial blessing, so you'll turn to me and say, Lord, please help me. He'll take your financial blessing. You say, well, that's not right. Well, tell that to Job. When God wanted to make a point with Job, he took everything away. But when Job proved true, God gave him double what he took. And so when God tests you, say, thank you, Lord, for the test. I'm going to walk through this test. I may not like it. But I'm going to be faithful through it. And when you're faithful through it, God says, now let me show you how I can bless you. So, carrying on. The title of identification, he says, he was the amen. The faithful and true witness the beginning of the creation of God. So as the amen, meaning so be it, he indicates his sovereignty and the certainty of the fulfillment of his promises. 2 Corinthians 1 and 20 says, For all the promises of God in him are yea and in him amen unto the glory of God by us. So when Jesus speaks it is the final word. I could preach on that right now. When Jesus speaks, it's the final word. When he puts an amen on it, it's done. Sometimes he's just waiting for us to allow him to speak into our life. I've said it before. He's the perfect gentleman. He will not impose himself upon you. But when you say, Lord, speak into my life. Speaking to who I am, he's got the final word, and it will come to pass. He is then identified as the faithful and true witness. The fact that he is both a faithful and a true witness gives special weight to the words which he speaks. Finally, Jesus is called the beginning of the creation of God. As the beginning, he is not the first of creation, but he is before all creation. He, it is, is the source. He was the fountainhead of creation. He was the alpha and omega. He was the beginning and the ending. Amen. He was the creator. Amen. The whole context of revelation indicates that Christ is God, the creator. Amen. Men have struggled with this for years. Amen. Trying to figure out who Jesus is. But one thing that you'll understand in the book of Revelation. Amen. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Amen. He is. Amen. God manifested in the flesh. Justified of the spirit. Seen of angels. Come on. Testified of men. Received up into glory. Amen. It was the fullness of the Godhead that dwelled in him bodily. Amen. He was all man and he was all God. Amen. Spirit flowed through him. Amen. Just like it flows through us. And yet the identification uh, is this, that the Holy Ghost overshadowed him 
and gave life to the seed of Mary, which became Jesus Christ the man. And the man was the son of God. Now, I'm not trying to get you all messed up, but I want you to stay with me. Sonship. The need of a Savior. The need of a Redeemer. Amen. The Son of God lived for 33 and a half years. He said, I come in my Father's name. Amen. Before that time, there was no identification. Amen. As Brother Bernard so eloquently gave it to us last week about the power of the name. Amen. We call upon His name. His name identifies Father. His name identifies Son. His name identifies Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Jehovah has become our salvation. Or God has become our salvation. That's who Jesus is. He's the beginning and He is the... And when I begin to think of who he is, because when he died on that cross, the flesh died. The flesh gave up the ghost. Right. The, the mortal passed away. And yet, the immortal God, who was Christ Jesus, amen, why his physical man laid in that tomb for those three days amen we know that he went down and took the keys to, to death hell amen he, he took the keys and he took the power he took authority over all those dominions and he rose on the third day and they moved the stone away and jesus stepped on the scene amen a risen savior Amen. He said to his disciples, don't touch me. Amen. I'm not, I haven't been up to glory yet, but uh, when he got up to glory, he came back and said, now you can touch me. Well, I don't know about you, but that excites me. And so there was an advocate with the Spirit of God who is the Father. Eyes have not seen, ears have not heard who he is, what he is. Amen. And now in the embodiment of Jesus Christ is God Almighty. Before we couldn't know Him because He was Spirit. <laughs> he was Spirit. But because of Jesus Christ being born of a woman, giving His life, and yet resurrecting again, now we have a face of God, which is Jesus Christ. I hope I'm not losing anybody. I'm hoping you're staying with me. Amen. That's why Paul would write, there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one Lord above all, through all, and in you all. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go a little further in here because he begins to speak about uh, how that they would um, share his throne. I will grant, I may be getting ahead of myself, but I want you to understand something. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit in with me in my throne. Now there's just one throne in heaven. And yet, he says, as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. Now, you got to understand something. The throne is a position of authority. I mean, you know, and there's those that would like to say that, well, you know, there's this throne in heaven. And when we all get to heaven, Jesus is going to sit in the middle of the throne. And Brother Webb, he's going to be sitting over here. And Brother DJ, he's going to come sit over here. And Sister Teresa, she's going to sit on the back. And... Just about no. What he's talking about there is the authority. That comes from being there. 
Now, you think about it. And the Lord's really been working on me in this. He gave us authority. He gave us apostolic authority. He said, you shall be endued with power after that the Holy Ghost comes upon you. What he's saying is, you shall be endued with authority. And the Lord has been pushing that into my spirit more and more. Why? Because when we go into spiritual warfare, sometimes we go in like a bunch of tender ninnies. I, that's an old country word there for, you know, that's all I can say. You know, we, you go, when you go into spiritual warfare, don't go in meek. D don't go in with meekness. Now, devil, you get out of my house. Devil, you stop tormenting my children. We're even afraid to call out a spirit. Sometimes, and brother, why are you walking all in it tonight? But you know what? Sometimes we don't even want to address them because we're afraid they're going to jump on us. But you know what? You got to tell that devil. You got to begin to speak to that spirit. You got to take dominion over that spirit. You got to take over that spirit in your house. Hey, man, you, I know I, I've told you about her, but if you could only know my precious little old grandmother. I mean, all four foot eleven of her. Hey, Amen. You know what? Uh, she wasn't very big, but boy, she was powerful. She was an authoritative woman. You walked in her kitchen, she was the boss. She had a frying pan to prove it. <laughs> but she had spiritual authority. She made a pledge one time to give to She's for Christ or something, $1,000, and she prayed, and the Lord sent a tornado. You will never convince me otherwise. Didn't do hardly any damage to anything around, but an old shed they had on the place that we're going to get rid of anyway got all ripped to shred, and she got $1,000 for it. So you, you can tell, oh, brother, no, 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 no. No, I watched her sit in that chair. 4.30 in the morning, get to pray. And I've watched her, amen, just begin to touch God and begin to pray over things and take dominion over things. I've watched her, amen, cast devils out of her house. Get that broom and, and just broom that old ugly spirit out of the house. You get out of my house. Amen. And so what I, when, we, when, when we get to heaven, we are going to have authority with him as he has authority with his father. Because a throne depicts authority. The throne depicts rule. Whoever sits on the throne has the rule. Hello? So we are going to rule and reign with Christ for eternity. Hallelujah. So, what is this condemnation? They are condemned for their lukewarmness. It refers to the state of those who have manifested some interest in the things of God. Those professing Christians who attend church but have fallen far short of a true testimony for the Lord Jesus. Those who go through the motions. Those who, uh, you know, we, we've gotten so politically correct, we just, we're very nice in our day and age. But I'm not so young that I can't remember back when I was a little guy. Preachers used to call people out. Now, I can't say it was always for the good. I mean, a couple of years ago, there was an, a Baptist preacher preaching at a large Baptist church outside of Tulsa, Oklahoma. And he, he, he went viral because he stopped in the middle of his preaching and said, so-and-so, you need to wake up. Go wash your face. And then he started walking out amongst them and saying, and you, here are you coming in this church, you know, where have you been the last three weeks? You want me to marry you? 
But you can't be faithful to the house of God or the things of God. Yeah, I mean, you know. And you know I love you. He tells you, you know I love you. Yeah, but you know. And then he's like, and you back in the sound booth, you start to set your own kingdom up there in the sound booth. <laughs> he said, Brother So, you try to set your own little kingdom up back here in the sound. Boy, he started, he says, and I know your mama. She's a precious woman. She's one of my best friends. But mama, you're going to have to tie those, uh, you know, untie those apron strings. Let the man of God deal with your son. Y'all can go see it for yourselves. I'm, you know, and that was in this day and age. And a lot of people would get offended. Would get offended. But then I got to read about how many people Jesus offended. He offended the Pharisees. He offended his own disciples. He offended the people. Most of all, he offended the devil. But, you know, there are so many, if we're not careful... We don't have a fear. We used to, we used to have a healthy respect, okay? We, we won't use the word fear, but we'll have a healthy respect. And sometimes I think my fellow ministers of the gospel bring that on themselves. Because they want to be hip and want to be cool and want to be accepted. And, and uh, you know, in this modern day and age, you know, just... Uh, let me just be... I love you. I want you to love me. And I want you to consider me a friend. But at the same time, I didn't come down here to be your friend. I came down here to be your pastor. <laughs> well, praise God. And there's times when I can reach out to you as a friend. But there's times I have to be a pastor and say, look. You need to get it right. You need to straighten up. You need to pray more. You need to fast more. You need to be faithful in your giving. You, you, you just need to get a hold of God. And it had nothing to do with how much I care for you or love you. Amen. I, 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 that has nothing to do with it. But, uh, you know, the problem with a lot of folks is, is, is they expect that, well, because they believe in him, they can just come and he ought to be satisfied. You're not even hot. You're not cold. Sometimes you shout. Sometimes you don't. You say one thing and then you're another. That's what he was talking about. There is no one farther from the truth in Jesus than one who makes an idle profession without real faith. I thought that was profound. There is no one further from the Lord that you have an idle profession of faith. You say you believe, but you don't believe. You say you want the Lord to work in your life, but you don't allow him to work in your life. You say you're going to praise the Lord, but then you don't praise the Lord. That was Laodicea. The Laodicean church constitutes a sad picture of much of the professing church. The result is that Christianity, amen, becomes about membership and organization. It becomes nothing more than a glorified social club. And I love social events. I love it when the church gets together in fellowship. I love, amen, I've been called the party and preacher and I'm okay with that. If it's done in the right spirit, the right attitude, because I believe people need to come together. I believe that people need to walk arm in arm, love one another, because if you can't love somebody down here, hello. If, if I can't love my brother here, I'm not going to make it over there. One man said this, Brother, uh, Brother Jack Cunningham was preaching. And he was talking about uh, a large uh, black congregation in St. Louis, one of the believers. And uh, he said the pastor said, made this statement. He said, you know what? If we can't get along with our brothers down here. And he was talking about the white brothers. 
He said, we won't get along with them over there. And the truth is, if I can't get along with Brother Webb and Brother Waddy down here, and I'm not trying, but if I can't get along, amen, with my black brothers down here or my Hispanic brothers down here or my Chinese brothers down here or my Pakistani brothers down here, and, it's a, and we have to fight against the flesh. Yes, we do. We have to fight against the flesh. We have to fight against old prejudice. We've got to fight against the things that was handed down from generation to generation that should have never been. But we, that's what we fight. But we're overcoming them together. Amen. We're overcoming them together. I have to battle things in my own spirit. Maybe you don't, but I have to battle things in my spirit. When I get around somebody that, that I know is professing Islam, I, 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 I'm watching them. But I have to be careful, Sister Lupe. I don't want that to get into my spirit. Maybe y'all's better than me. I'm just being transparent tonight. But if I go to the mall and I'm walking through and I see an Islamic family and a woman in a, in a burqa, I'm watching her. And y'all, y'all laughing, but it, that's the day and age we're living in. We got to be careful that we don't let society build prejudices in us against one another. Because if I can't love them, how can I reach them? Huh? You know, they're these these pranksters. They like to play pranks, you know. And and uh, because of the day and age, is they'll take a uh, you know a backpack and load it with just clothes and stuff and they'll take a black bag and they'll dress up you know in in, in uh, arab air like they dress over in the middle east and and they'll walk into somewhere and throw the bag down and take off running and you see people scatter and i'll, I'll be honest if if i saw someone dressed in mid, middle eastern attire with a backpack and they walked into a business where i was at and they threw the backpack in and took off running i'm joining them but you know <laughs> Why is that? It's because of what has happened in our society. And, and what is happening is, is it's building up a, a prejudice within us against another culture. Now, some of that's brought on because of behavior. But we have to be careful as Christians. I believe we need to reach every soul that God wants us to reach. I don't care where they come from. I don't care what their background is. I don't care what their ethnicity is. I don't care what they've done wrong in their life. I believe the blood of Jesus can cover every, everything. I believe a murderer can be saved. Amen. I believe a robber, a thief can be saved. Amen. I believe, that, and, and I just won't go into more detail, but it doesn't matter what you've done. Amen. If you come to the cross of Jesus Christ uh, and allow the blood of Jesus to cover your sins, uh, he'll wash you white as snow, and those sins will be forgotten for eternity. And I'm starting to get into my Sunday morning message. I better leave it alone. <laughs> There's, there is no commendation for the Laodiceans. There was no... Uh, Good job there, or, or you know, you've been faithful, or or you you you've done well. No, their their lack of economic need seems to have blinded their eyes to their dire need of spiritual riches. And one reason I feel that our churches in this day and age, Amen. And and there's lots of articles about the dying church because here in America because people aren't going to church as much as they used to. And the reason why is because, hey, they don't need God in their life. They don't need the Lord to provide for them. They don't need the Lord to protect them. What was funny is if, if somebody's child joins the military, they tended to pray more. Why are you laughing, Brother Tima? Because you got a son in the military now and it's on your mind. What if something happens to him? What if somebody takes a shot at him? Because they're going to put themselves in harm's way. It's, you know, it gets real serious now. Now, Lord, I really, I've got a need. I need you to. 
But in our day and age, you know, we're, people are turned on to mega churches. They want more entertainment than they want word. I mean, even our largest churches, when you compare them to churches in the world, are small. Brother Haney's church in California runs roughly about 6,000 people. As far as I know, that's our largest one church here in the States. And, and the way he has it set up, for every 200 people, there's a pastor. And he's got several pastors. He's got several congregations. Uh, you know, he's got a Spanish congregation. All that's all going on out there at the same time. And they all answer back to, to Brother Haney. It's, a, it's, it's something that has been put into effect through years and years and years of structure. But 6,000. When there are churches just up the road that every Sunday run over 16,000 per service and they claim to have over 40,000 members. At one time, Joel Osteen's father, a man who had received the revelation of Jesus' name, baptism, and infinite, he preached Holy Ghost. But he told Brother Kilgore, if I started preaching Jesus' name, baptism, I'd lose my congregation. If I started preaching holiness, I'd lose my congregation. Uh, he, they made a boast, we don't take tithes. His father made the boast that I don't take tithes, I just take the Sunday, Sunday night offering. Well, back then when you're running 10, 12,000 people, I take the Sunday night offering. <laughs> Everybody just gives a dollar, we're doing good. And his son says I don't take an offering. He wrote a few books and made a few million. So, you know, money is not an issue with them. Um, but the thing is, is when you look into those things, they're not, the this, this, this spiritual life has been taken from them. The atmosphere is more of like going to a concert. I mean, is, is, and I'm not trying to beat up on Lakewood, uh, you know, but the thing is, is uh, it used to be a venue where you went and watched basketball and, and went to concerts. And, and so you go there and you're entertained. I had a man that I used to work with show me a video clip on his phone. He says, I, I went to this church, and he says, but I've been to concerts that had, didn't have light shows this good. And so it becomes a feel good. It becomes where everything's acceptable. That nothing is sin. Hello? Nothing's sin. Nothing's wrong, you know. We're all just going to make it to heaven. Well, that's a heresy. Jesus points this out by saying that they do not know that they are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. As describing them as poor, Jesus indicates they're extremely poor, reduced to begging. Think about it. There are those that are so blessed financially in this world, materially. You know, not, not, how many of y'all like T.D. Jakes? Yeah. Uh, he's exciting. He, he knows truth. He knows truth. He knows Jesus' name, baptism. He knows him filling of the Holy Ghost. Brother Lewis and I were talking just Tuesday morning. He came down, took his baby to see Sister Bumgarner. Then he came to the house, we got to talking. T.D. Jakes and them used to run with Bishop Norman Wagner, who was the uh, general superintendent of the PAW, Pentecost Sims of the World. He had truth. He knew truth. He was licensed with them at one time. How many of you know who Merle Ewing is? Brother Merle Ewing, you know, great preacher of the gospel, great singer. Hey, man, if you've never heard him sing, you need to find some of his stuff. It's awesome. He gets you into the flow of the Holy Ghost. Lake Charles, Louisiana. His son, Landy, 
very talented musician, had a recording studio, walked away from the truth, started running with the, that realm, the charismatic realm of, of, of worshipers, and, and he was at T.D. Jakes' church, Potter's house in Dallas, Texas. T.D. Jakes told, went up to him and said, look, you need to go back to your daddy's house because what you have is what we want. And at the bottom, or at the end of it all, it does not matter how massive a sanctuary is. It does not matter, amen, how popular you are. It does not matter how many millions follow after you because the blind leave the blind and they all fall in the ditch. And so the thing is, is they think they're rich when really they're poor because they don't even have, amen, that relationship uh, Amen. That, that Grandma Blue Hair has has been living for God for 50 years. It's been tied into the Spirit and living right and doing right. And amen. She may live week to week, paycheck to paycheck. Amen. Might be on Social Security. Amen. May have to struggle to make uh, rub two pennies together. But what she has in the Lord is far richer, far greater than a man that can drive a Lexus. I'm not against driving a Lexus. Amen. Preachers get up and start talking about, well, I need an airplane. If you just knew why I needed an airplane. And I'm not throwing this out there. I'm not trying to be political. But you know what? There's preachers that are just trying to be the next Donald Trump. But they're not building casinos. They're trying to build churches, quote unquote. And it, and, it, and it aggravates the Lord. He's looking for people who want to be rich in His mercy and rich in His glory and rich in the things of God, not rich in the things of this world. I don't think He has a problem with you being blessed. I don't think he has a problem with you living in a nice home, driving a good automobile, being a good steward. To, I don't think he, but I do believe he has a problem when we start making the kingdom of God something to profit from. Amen. And so he says, spiritually, if you could just see yourself, you're nothing more than a beggar. Unable to perceive spiritual things. You see, they have copied Pentecost, and I'm trying to hurry, to the place where, amen, we have learned that, amen, if we get a good beat going, and I'm all for a good beat, but we got to be careful that I'm not just shouting to the beat to, or I'm not just dancing to the beat. Now, I believe you ought to worship the Lord, and it, believes it starts in the flesh. You know why it starts in the flesh? Because God put us in flesh. And sometimes worshiping him in the flesh is a submission to the spirit. And I can't get into the spirit until I've submitted the flesh. Flesh says, don't worship the Lord. People are watching. Flesh says, don't, make, don't embarrass me. You need to stop worrying about being an embarrassment and praise him. Yeah, man, you need to lay aside that and say, Lord, Whatever you have for me, I want to do. I want to move into the Spirit. I want to move into what you have for us. He said they were naked. They were exposed. We live in a day and age that craziness happens all around us. Just this past week, right in Houston, Texas. Lady gets out there in the middle of the freeway. Exposes herself to everybody. Stops traffic. You say, well, what, why are you saying? Because when you get to a place where you're willing to expose everything, you're off your rocker. And you know what? When, when an individual in the spirit realm when God looks at you and says, you're not clothed in righteousness, 
You're not clothed in holiness. You think you've got it all together, but really, amen, you stand before me totally exposed. I see you for who you really are. And it's a very scary thought to me because I want to make sure when the Lord sees me, he sees a reflection of himself. I don't want to be exposed to him. Amen. And him say, look at you. You think you're clothed in righteousness, but you're just a beggar. You're stripped down to nothing, boy. You need to get some Holy Ghost clothes on. You need to get some truth on. You need to gird yourself with truth. The church at Laodicea. We're lulled into a false contentment by their temporal sufficiency. Spiritually, they were poor because they were without real and eternal possessions. And were lacking a spiritual eye to view the true riches. I'm bringing it to a close. But the thing is, Jesus said it like this. What profit if a man shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul I, I'm thankful the Lord is my provider I'm thankful that he takes care of my family I'm thankful for that but I pray Lord never let me get to the place where I feel that I don't need you one of the great testimonies of the Philadelphia church was they had a little strength. You know what? If we can just have a little strength in the Lord, it's more than enough to keep us. Jesus offers this advice. I counsel thee to buy me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see us. Now the people of Laodicea were famous for two kinds of medicine. Namely, an ointment for sore ears and an eye powder for sore eyes. Isn't it funny that the Lord would tell them, you know those things that you're famous for? You need to get some spiritual application. Sometimes I pray, Lord, I want you to anoint my eyes and anoint my ears. Let me hear, Lord. That's one reason I always pray that. I want my ears to be anointed so that the word of God can penetrate me to the inside. I want my eyes to be open so I can see. I want to see truth. Finally, Jesus warns Leo to see it to repent. He says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. God is not seeking to discipline those who make no pretense of following him, but rather he wants to deal with those who claim to be his children. He said, if I love you, I'm going to rebuke you. If I love you, I'm going to correct you. If I love you, I'm going to try to get you straight. And his only desire, and I'm, I'm coming to a close. His only desire was this, that they repent. And his only desire for you and I, when we make mistakes and we fall down and we mess up, is that we go to the throne of God and repent. What was it that made David a man after God's own heart? Was it, was it his uh, exploits in the battlefield? No. Was it the killing of Goliath? No. Was it the slaying of the Philistines? No. What was it that made him a man after God's own heart? Because he was a murderer. He was an adulterer. But what gave him a heart like unto the Lord or made him a man after God's own heart was he was willing to come to God, rent his clothes as they did in that time and say, God, I'm a worthless sinner. My righteousness is as filthy rags. Uh, I am nobody. I am no good. I am nothing. Uh, and I need to be clothed in your righteousness. It was because he had an attitude that said, I know that I am not worthy to be king. Uh, I am not worthy, amen, to be praised. 
I am a man who has done wicked and evil things. He said, be zealous. That means when you repent, repent with a fervency. Turn away from your wickedness with a fervency. Turn back to God with a fervency. Live for him with everything you got in you. Amen. I'm going to tell you something. If you live for God with everything you have in you, you will not struggle. You're going to get stronger. You're going to get branded a, a wildfire in the church. And, and people are going to say, man, that man's crazy in the church, you know. But you know what? If, if I don't live for God this hard, the devil's going to pull me even harder. The reason why I live for God so hard is that the temptations of the world are all around us. Amen. And it's just trying to pull us back into the world and the things of the world. Amen. You start uh, slipping up. You start uh, giving the devil some room and you'll fall right back into the mess he pulled you out of. So I'm going to zealously follow him. I'm going to zealously repent every day. I'm going to zealously teach and preach the gospel. I'm going to zealously, amen. I'm, what I listen to on the radio is going to glorify God. What I, what I watch on the screen is going to glorify God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. My conversation is going to glorify God. Well, 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 glory. Otherwise, what happens? We get lulled into a, a sense of, I'm okay. Look how blessed I am. You know, one of the greatest deceptions about blessings, and I'm coming to a close. The devil says, well, look how blessed you are. Look at all this money you got. Jesus said it like this. It's easier for the camel to go through the eye of a needle than the rich man to make it to heaven. That's me paraphrasing it. Why? Because, well, I'm blessed. Look how blessed I am. I got money. I got all these riches. I got all these how. I got all this stuff. Surely God's blessing me. Surely this is the Lord. But remember this one thing. When Lucifer was tempting Jesus, he offered him all the wealth of the world. If he would bow down and praise him. So we can't mistake our financial blessings as the favor of God. That means I believe you're blessed. I believe you're, you're, you know. But the thing of it is, is where do we find the true favor of God? In the things which are spiritual. In the things that, 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 that he finds riches in. What's he find riches? When I have prayed and I have touched the throne of God. Oh. I've gained another crown in my, a jewel in my crown. Oh, you're rich in me, brother. You're rich in me, sister, because, oh, you've allowed me to cultivate in you true blessings. Peace, joy, faith, love, hope. Praise God. Let's stand to our feet tonight. Laodicea. Let's not be like them, folks. I'm thankful you're blessed. I'm thankful, but I don't want us to fall into the trap that they did. What was their biggest mistake? We're well taken care of, Lord. We are sufficient without you. And if we ever get to that place, we are going to miss. We're going to miss the mark. Lord, I thank you tonight that you are all sufficient. Lord, I know we're a blessed people. I have been in other places in this world, Lord. Where my, my heart just rose up into my throat because of the suffering. But I know, Lord Jesus, that you are the one I need to lean on and trust in and believe in. Not the riches of this world. Not the doctors of this world. Not the bankers, not the lawyers. Not, none of those things can save my soul and keep me. Only you, Lord Jesus, can give me strength today to help me. And I'm asking you to bless this congregation. Please, Lord, do not let a Laodicean spirit come upon this church. I pray a hedge and a covering around us that we will not allow that spirit, no matter how blessed we become financially, Lord, I pray that we never allow that to keep us, Lord, from being faithful to your word, to your spirit, to you, almighty God. And I pray that in Jesus' name. Can the church say amen? Praise God. That's, 
That's going to conclude all of our lessons on the churches. I will encourage you, go back, study them, follow them, learn from them, gain strength from them. Amen? Praise God. You're dismissed tonight in Jesus' name. Greetings.